Wake up. Power off. Stage two. In the news, cable theft, electricity hike, late for work, traffic jams, escorts of bush. Stage four, memes. Ads for generators, in the news, economic struggles, crisis, state of disaster, phone can't charge any faster, battery low, can't cook, can't work, another unit down, stage six. Reality, until further notice. Eskom must be one of the most hated names in South Africa. It's on our minds, hourly. Talk about an abusive relationship, hot and cold. Our day-to-day is controlled by an on and off switch. And unless you can afford to go off the grid, divorce is not an option. But how did South Africa end up in this marriage? And who should we blame for the blackouts? You're watching slow. And to begin to understand, let's go back to the beginning of ESCOM, 100 years back. The need for power begins with gold. Gold mining and railways switching from steam to electricity gave way to the Electricity Act in 1922. The goal? To stimulate the provision, wherever acquired, of cheap and abundant supply of electricity. Ironic. In 1923, ESCOM was established by the South African government. Soon after, ESCOM built its first power stations. And as the gold price went up, so did the demand for electricity and more power stations. To do this, ESCOM obtained loans and paid it back years before the due date, without tapping the taxpayers' wallets. The Second World War came and went. The economy was booming and everybody wanted to plug into convenience. By the early 70s, the dream of a national grid finally became a reality. But the more ESCOM expanded, the more money was needed. Several factors were against them. The cost of borrowing was high. And because of apartheid, South Africa was isolated from capital markets. With the Electricity Amendment Act of 1971, ESCOM could use tariffs to build up capital and to protect consumers from big price hikes in the future. It was a balancing act to keep the lights on and to keep the people happy. In the late 80s, only 40% of South Africa had electricity. The political pressure was huge to bring more power to more people. And this was done, but it came with its own problems. Not everyone could afford electricity. And by 1994, Eskom was already owed 920 million rand. With the new South Africa, it was finally declared that electricity is a basic human right. The goal was set. Electrify 1.75 million homes by the year 2000. It seemed the good times were here. Eskom won numerous awards. From being recognized for uplifting South Africans to being the power company of the year in 2001, at the Global Energy Awards in New York. Then, 2007 rolled by, and South Africa was introduced to a new word. Load shedding. And so I think it is very tempting to dress it up in some cutesy phrase of load shedding. Load shedding is a power cut. The burning question. Where did it all go wrong? And who is to blame? Who is the villain in our story? It's a bitter pill to swallow, but load shedding doesn't happen to spite us. It happens to prevent a complete blackout. Let's explain. This is our total installed capacity. This is for peak power demand. It's run by open cycle gas turbines that use diesel and pump storage schemes, or in other words, dams. But this is lost due to planned maintenance. This is lost because of unplanned breakdowns. And this goes because partial load losses when a unit can't run at full capacity. But we still have some for peak power demand, right? Not always. 
Sometimes water can't be pumped back into the dam's upper level. And then there's diesel shortages. So we might as well say goodbye to this. And now we sit in a situation where we need this much electricity. But this is what we have to work with. Hello, stage six load shedding. But who is the real culprit here? It's not the apartheid. If electricity was viewed as a basic human right 50 or 60 years ago, there would have been more capacity created to connect more people. However, in the last three decades, businesses have changed and there's 20 million more people today than in 1994. So the need for power is exponentially higher. In 1998, cabinet approved a white paper on energy. It was time to make a decision to spend money on building new power stations by 1999. The research showed that South Africa will run out of electricity. Coal fire stations built in the 70s and 80s were already pushed too far and too long beyond their design perimeters. Unfortunately, the documentation of the cost was only finalized by mid-2007. A few months later, load shedding was implemented. And this has devastated our economy ever since. We need to act urgently to end load shedding that is causing such huge damage to our economy. But I'm sure you are going to tell us that load shedding that is disrupting your own business operations and frustrating your efforts to reach higher levels of growth. Let me remind you, Mr. President, it was you who in 2015 told us as South Africans that within 18 months to two years, we would forget that the problems with Eskom and load shedding ever happened. So the president has made a promise that there would be no load shedding. We've seen load shedding at its worst level ever. The greatest threat to South Africa and to South Africans is Eskom and the ruling party. The price of electricity just goes up and up. With the price up, the sales are down and Eskom is still making a loss. Want to go green? That's easier said than done. About 85% of our electricity is generated by coal. There are so many vested interests in the coal value chain that the threat of decarbonisation, even though we're talking about a multi-decade move, gradual, very gradual move away from coal, why that is so eagerly opposed and with, and with such vehemence. At the moment we have, you know, guilt about our great reserves of coal and fossil fuels. Let's not be guilty anymore. Why should we listen to the international community that says we can't use our coal? They used coal, now they've got guilt about climate change. And they're telling us they're still we... are using coal. Correct. So we should go back to fossil fuel and get our energy independency. But we need to add nuclear and we need to add gas. There are no new mines we are going to open because in the last 10 years we have had no exploration expenditure. So geologically we have got lesser understanding of where this country is. So the minerals in terms of processing and otherwise you're not going to see that. But when you talk about the four IR economies, whether data centers or cryptocurrency mining, all of that is an unknown but it's energy intensive. But there is not a single major player that has made that commitment that they are going to invest in those industries which are energy intensive, therefore capitalism. The, the, the consequences are catastrophic to say the least. If we want more power, we need more power stations. Under the right management, it takes about 10 years from the decision to build a new coal or nuclear power station before it begins to make electricity. Now, bear in mind that ESCOM cannot, by law, procure its own electricity. We cannot go and build new power stations. We are required to apply for a Section 34 determination from the Department of Mineral Resources and Energy. My somewhat less than illustrious predecessors refused to sign power purchase agreements with IPPs on grounds that this would not be in the interests of ESCOM. 
There are calculations done by energy experts that have indicated that as much as 95% of load shedding today could have been avoided if those contracts had in fact been signed. And then there's ESCOM's ever-revolving door of management. If you look at the private sector, when you rotate directors in and out, you typically do it up to a third of the board at a time in order to preserve institutional memory. With the cyanide poisoning of previous CEO, Andre de Reiter, one can understand that it's not a job for the faint-hearted. About 15-20 minutes after this cup of coffee, I started feeling uh, extremely nauseous and shaking, gasping for air. Uh, so the doctor was running up and down and one of his colleagues called him over and said, what's wrong with that guy? And he said, well, we don't know, we're running tests. His colleague told him, I've seen this before, this is cyanide poisoning. Here's the truth. At the bottom of our woes lies more than just a monopoly that is ESCOM. It's a haphazard failure of political interference, corruption, crime, incompetence, debt, and the lack of maintenance. Here's your culprit. The process of cancer fighting to stay alive is called metastasis. It happens when there's a failure in the regulation of cell growth. It spreads from its original location to affect another. If we don't understand the disease and where it spreads, we'll never find a cure. Whatever language you want to call it, in the language of public policy, a self-interest group. Those in power blame everyone and everything but themselves for the electricity crisis. And what is clear, Mr. President, is that every time your ministers don't perform, instead of firing them, you protect them by taking things into the presidency. Be decisive, Mr. President. Fire them. Criminality is well embedded and well organized. It operates like the Mafia. There's a diesel Mafia, a cable Mafia. Every single element of ESCOM has a Mafia involved, okay? And they are stealing and breaking. But the coal corruption has been ongoing since 2001. The coal corruption has just got bigger and bigger and bigger and worse and worse and worse. So, so some have suspected, uh, but you're saying that load shedding can be directly placed at the door of the Guptas. Tell us how. Contracts are tainted by corruption, fraud and money laundering is rife. Dodgy contracts totaling 178 billion rand were investigated by a law firm. However, in 2019, it was shut down by senior members of ESCOM's management. Cable theft alone is costing the economy more than 47 billion rand a year. And that's only when you're looking at the losses of ESCOM, PRASA, Transnet and the reduced output of the mining industry. To put that into perspective, that's more than 130 million rand every single day. This is definitely planned, this is definitely funded, and I'm saying it live on TV that this is funded. It is a very sophisticated syndicate. The way they operate, it clearly shows that they know where, what they are doing. Municipalities owe ESCOM more than 68 billion rand. Government will take on more than half of ESCOM's debt, but the bailout won't keep the lights on. Municipal debt will soon be ESCOM's second biggest liability. Forty meetings of an interministerial task team haven't been able to come up with a plan. There is no way you can force them to pay. Our power stations are getting older and the ailments are creeping in. They are in a situation where they cannot even predict what's going to happen a few hours ahead. The plants are breaking down that frequently. But if you keep the lights on at all costs, as we did for many years, you just postpone the day of darkness. The effect of load shedding goes far beyond missing out on our morning coffee. Businesses not only lose money, they shut shop. Some even see greener grass and immigrate. 
I'm concerned about the people leading this country. Do they understand the economics of the country? Do they care? This is a huge concern to us as NBBC. Agriculture suffers to the point where food security is a serious threat. And, and how much of a threat it, it is for food security? <coughs> yeah, no. Uh, we are going to die. We are going to die. The plants are going to die. We need to irrigate them. Traffic is a mess. Crime is higher because when the lights are out, the criminals are out. Load shedding is killing the response time of emergency services. And the health of South Africans is in danger. Only 10% of public hospitals are spared from load shedding. And when people die, backup power is needed to preserve their bodies for burial. A luxury for many mortuaries. The list of consequences go on and on. It sounds ridiculous, but for now we should probably appreciate load shedding. Without it, a complete blackout is more of a reality than a possibility. And that will mean weeks without any electricity. Power will have to get back online from scratch. The question on everyone's lips, what is the way forward? What we've heard today, we are not convinced that even in 10 years we're going to solve these problems. We're already now drawing energy from the neighboring countries. We also sell to the other countries as well. So I think we have a serious problem. The government does not have a comprehensive plan in place to deal with the energy crisis. We've said before, you need a minimum of one and a half trillion rand and it's going to take you up to 10 years if you start today. To privatize or not to privatize? Will a state of disaster help? How will the 2024 elections impact load shedding? The answer, it's as much in the dark as we are. We regret to inform you. Stay tuned for the inevitable sequel of this video. Why don't we find out what is bedeviling ESCOM? What's bedeviling ESCOM is the political interference. That needs yeah. to be taken out of the entity. Yes. And this needs to be run professionally because it yes. has been done. It can be done again. When ESCOM yes. was conceptualized uh, with uh, Van der Bale as the first chairperson of it, that was one yes. of the conditions that government stays out of it. And it was run by professionals.